Well, it's always a pleasure to have you join us on News Now. I am Fidelia Agoncha. Twelve persons have been confirmed dead in multiple road crashes along the Ibadan Ife Expressway. The crash, which involved three cars, a trailer and two buses, also left seven others injured. In all, 19 people were involved in the crash, which had 10 male adults, 8 female adults and one male child who was among the dead. Oyo State FRC Sector Commander Cecilia Alao says the injured persons have been taken to the hospital for medical attention while the dead have been moved to the morgue of the Oyo State Specialist Hospital. The Katsina State Government says the state is under siege by bandits, armed robbers and kidnappers. Governor of the state, Aminu Masari, raised the alarm during the opening ceremony of an extraordinary security meeting. The one-day summit organized by the state government is to prefer solutions to the state's current insecurity challenges. Soldiers, policemen, operatives of the Department of State Services and other security agencies attended the meeting. The Nigerian army says it is working with the international police to extradite a Nigerian in diaspora, Perry Pruma, um, back to the country for prosecution. Army spokesperson Brigadier General Sane Usman says Bruma is wanted for launching a criminal fundraising campaign. The suspect had opened a GoFundMe account to plead for funds to feed Nigerian soldiers, but Usman says the campaign is to defraud unsuspecting members of the public, especially the international community, to fund rebellious activities and personal lifestyle. He also insists that the Nigerian soldiers across the country do not lack logistics or food and are not in need of any funds. Well, in Abuja, the police has continued its siege on the residence of Kogi State Senator Dino Malaye. Malaye is wanted by the police for culpable homicide in the shooting of a police officer. The officers have been at his residence since last Friday to arrest him for the incident which happened in July 2018. The force have also cut off power supply to his home, but a senator who um, who, has issued, who has issued an invitation last year has so far refused to surrender to the police. He has maintained his innocence and is accusing the police of infringing on his fundamental human rights. A Lagos-based rights campaigner, Malcolm Omoribo, has asked the Federal High Court in Abuja to declare as unlawful and unconstitutional the declaration of Operation Python Dance by the Army across the nation. The applicant is seeking the court's declaration that the commencement of a nationwide Operation Python Dance with effect from January 1st to February 28th is illegal and undemocratic. He says it violates his fundamental rights and that of other Nigerians. The applicant wants the court to declare that it is a primary responsibility of the police force to tackle internal security challenges such as kidnapping, terrorism, militancy and proliferation of firearms and not that of the armed forces. And in politics, the All Progressives Congress is accusing the People's Democratic Party of trying to hijack the current government. Party spokesperson Lanry Isaonilu says those who defected from the party in 2018 constituted themselves as a stumbling block for the APC administration using their vantage position in government. The APC spokesperson alleged that Atiku Abubakar, presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, paid huge amounts of money to con men in Dubai who pose as strategists to discredit President Buhari and leaders of the party ahead of the 2019 general election. Predictably, the forces of evil finally gravitated towards themselves and are now ensconced in their wicked nest called the PDP. Unfortunately, they did a lot of damage to our determined effort in the last three and a half years by constituting themselves into a stumbling block, using their vantage position in government in conjunction with their associates outside of government who have been deploying their hill gotten wealth to pervert justice, create a state of insecurity, propagate falsehood, and promote dissent. It was a callous strategy designed to pull the wool over the eyes of the people of this country. 
As frustrating as their activities were in 2018, they met more than their match in President Muhammadu Buhari. Their Dubai-made strategy has collapsed like a pack of cards. The plan was to recreate the 2014-2015 scenario when APC pilloried them for their crimes, which woken the electorate to the reality of the disaster we were headed under the PDP administration. PDP, led by their discredited presidential candidate, Alaji at Bubakar Atiku, paid huge sums of money to some foreign con men in Dubai who posed as strategists. They began to spawn daily fake news and make spurious and unsubstantiated allegations against our president, the family members of our president, the vice president, the APC national chairman, notable government officials and public institutions just to deceive Nigerians. Meanwhile, PDP spokesperson Kola Ologbodio has responded to his APC counterpart. Ologbodio says his party's candidate Atiku Abubakar remains the best choice for Nigerians. He also says the party does not have confidence in the leadership of the Nigerian police force. Our expectation of Nigerians is that they must not allow themselves to be intimidated. They must not allow any scaremongering about security intimidation to, to scare them from participating in the election. So our expectation of Nigerians is that they should turn out en masse and participate in the election. Our focus at this time is that INEC should conduct an election that will be free, that will be fair, that will be transparent and that will be accepted by majority of Nigerians. Once INEC does its job, the People's Democratic Party and our candidate, Atiku Abubakar, by the reality on ground across the six geopolitical zones of Nigeria today, will surely win the election. Agency of government that our party is very worried about is the police. The police has begun to demonstrate partisanship in the election. They have been intimidating our members. For instance, in Kebi State, just yesterday, I got report, the party got reports that the police commissioner was harassing our members over an issue that is purely a party issue. And for us, if there are issues within our party, we have a system of reconciliation and it is internal. So we do not expect the police to begin to harass the leadership of our party in Kebbi State or anywhere else. But that's the situation that we have been confronting. Our party is worried, and we have established this over and over, about the partisanship of the IG and the police. And our position is that with the way the IG is going, there is no way that we can have an election that will be transparent, that will be free. And we have cases in uh, Oshun, we have cases in Undo, we have a case in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Kwara at the by-election. We had in the by-election of Kogi State, where policemen were used to support thugs to hijack the electoral materials. So on account of that, there's no way we can have confidence under its leadership. Well, moving on, the United States Embassy in Abuja and Consulate in Lagos has reopened for visa applicants. On Monday, the embassy had announced that it was suspending operations over the shutdown in the U.S., but in a new statement, the embassy stated that only the American centers will be closed as visa appointments will not be affected by the government shutdown. In U.S. politics, a government shutdown occurs when Congress fails to appropriate funds for the following fiscal year. It could also occur when the president refuses to sign legislation for the funding of federal government operations and agencies. The shutdown, which is the third in the U.S. in 2018, began on the midnight of December 21. Well, news now will continue after this break. Don't go away.
In the last three years, we have built a multi-purpose center, which is the envy of all in our constituency. And I can tell you that the people who are living there are already enjoying it. Guy, do you think what this man just said is true? See, I seriously doubt. I'm sure it's one of those that silly lies. And hey, wait, do you know there's a way to find out if these things he's saying is true or not? Ah. This is the construct app. It gives people like us a sure way to track implementation of constituency projects. It gives valid and verified information on location of projects, amounts allocated, amounts funded, the level of job done, and even the profiles of concerned legislators. You and I can post directly on this app. Are you serious? This is the go-to app if you want to know how our commonwealth is being expended by the government. Wow. Let's even see if what this man said is true. Show me. The Construct app is developed by Other People Nigeria with support from USAID and is available on both Google Play Store and Apple Store. Eh, that is true. <laughs> of course, I told you. Welcome back. Well, as Nigeria slowly ushers in 2019, the Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Muda Yusuf, has been speaking on some of the factors he feels will be largely responsible for the growth of the Nigerian economy. Yusuf says the economy will again be dependent on the growth of the oil and gas sector, but wants the government to also focus on infrastructures to boost other sectors of the economy. The forecast will depend on what, uh, it, it has to be a conditional forecast. Conditional in the sense that the economy is still largely dependent on the oil and gas sector. So whatever we expect in terms of growth or economic performance, we have to depend on what happens in the oil industry. The oil market specifically, it depends on what happens with oil price, it depends on what happens with oil output. God I see correlation uh, over the years and from research that once we see a, an upward swing uh, in oil price, uh, we also see a positive impact on GDP performance. So if the oil price goes up, we are likely to see very good performance in terms of our GDP growth. But if oil price drops, we are likely to see a very serious systemic effects, not just on GDP growth, but on all other key economic variables, such as exchange rates and inflation. So these are, these are, so whatever focus we make has to be conditional on what happens to, 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 to the oil price and oil output. The slow recovery is because uh, the productivity in the economy is, is, is very low. Productivity, especially in the, in the non-oil sector of the economy. So the challenge is that of productivity. And productivity is a function of the environment that you create. It's a function of the, the infrastructure that you have. 
is a function of your financing, uh, financing, uh, the financing capacity, the kind of financing structure that you have. It's a function of your tax policy. It's a function of your monetary policy, your interest rate policy, your trade policy. So it's a function of so many things. But what is important is that the non-oil sectors still have uh, it's, it's not it's not performing as well as it should, and that is why we haven't seen the kind of uh, dramatic improvement in growth. If we're able to invest more uh, in, in in the infrastructure, if we're able to put in place reforms that will allow for more injection of private capital into this economy, I'm sure there will be a lot more impact on growth than, than what we are witnessing currently. Well, French oil major Total has started production at its Agena oil field in Nigeria, where it is expected to produce at least 200,000 barrels of oil in a day. That rate of output represents about 10% of Nigeria's current oil production. Total says the project is expected to significantly boost its oil production and cash flow from 2019 onwards. Well, meanwhile, the state oil company of, um, that is the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation says Nigeria's crude oil production rose to 2.09 million barrels a day in, 29, in 2018, compared to 1.86 million barrels in the year before. Oil market dropped by around 1% in 2019's first trading day on Wednesday, pulled down by surging U.S. output and concerns about economic slowdown in 2019. The international Brent crude features were at $53.27 um, per barrel, while U.S. crude features were at $45.01 per barrel. Traders say future prices fell on expectations of oversupply amid surging U.S. production and concerns about a global economic slowdown. Oil prices ended 2018 lower for the first time since 2015 after a desultory fourth quarter that saw buyers flee the market over growing worries about too much supply and mixed signals related to renewed U.S. sanctions on Iran. Well, to the stock market, trading at the Niger Stock Exchange started the year in the negative territory with supply outweighing demand as more investors sold off their equities. Well, this led to a 1.15% drop in key market indicators, which predominantly closed with declines, with the exception of um, the banking index. And in fact, equities from the banking and insurance index ranked top among the best performing stocks for 2018. Well, with over 79 billion naira earmarked for the construction of roads across the country in 2019, investors' confidence in the country's leading construction company, Julius Beggar, seems to have received a boost as demand for this low-cap equity surged, pushing its share price up by two naira. While well, second on the chart is international breweries starting the year with a one naira gain in its share price. And this is after it was ranked one of the worst performing stocks on the market in 2018 after losing 24 naira through the year. Well, analysts, however, say the decline is largely due to losses incurred by the firm during uh, following a bad merger. And at this share price, this is a good buy for long term investors who will be hoping that the equity will record again um, a year high reach of, of almost 70 naira um, as it did in 2018. And also on the chart is Vita Film and Custodian Investment PLC, two of the best performing stocks in 2019. And on the flip side, the consumer goods sector recorded the biggest loss in the market today, with equities from this index dominating the loser's chart. While on the um, top traders chart, Diamond Bank leads the pack, declining by three cover as more investors continue to sell off their shares from this equity, which by the end of the fourth quarter of this year will cease to exist. While on the global level, the Dow and FTSE suffered the same fate as the NSE with the duo crashing amid declines in crude oil prices. The Nikkei is, however, yet to resume trading for the year 2019. Well, we'll take a short break now to return with news from the foreign and sports scene. Don't go away. Corruption not in my country. Cut.
All right. What's your name again? Kemi? Yes, sir. Good. Are you ready for us for next week? Yes, sir. Next. Ndewo, sir. What? Look, what we need here is one who can speak fluent English. Give her a chance. I need a angel to hold me. Hold me, my beautiful angel. Cut! It is angel, not angel. Please, I'm done with you. Excuse us. Kemi was far better. It's not about our rendition. It's not about our performance here. By the time she and her friends join us in our hotel room, <laughs> you will know how far. Can I have her phone? She has a robust profile. She's a real robust profile. I do not undercut professional ethics. It is an act of corruption. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. Stop corruption now. On DG360, we don't just ask the questions. What is wrong with amending the constitution the way uh, the, the National Assembly members have been doing it? We seek answers. Constitution is constituent. Our problem is not um, lack of laws. Our problem is lack of the willpower to implement our laws. Answers that provide clarity. While we negotiate, we should try to make it a point that the girls must be complete. The clarity you need to make informed judgment so that you can make the right decision and take action. People are saying it is you politicians that are responsible for this, that you are the reason why oh. this is happening. All these dollars that call themselves governors in this country? I wish we had people like Tony at the National Assembly. God forbid that I go to join that team. Uh, DG360. Providing clarity to issues. Well, the death toll in landslides and floods in eastern Philippines has reached 85. Search, rescue and relief operations have been hampered by constant heavy rains recently, but officials are hoping to reach more communities as the weather begins to clear. At least 20 people were still missing from the landslides. 69 people have been reported dead in the eastern region of Bicol, while 16 others were killed in the nearby region of eastern Visayas and other areas in landslides and floods. At least 37 Fulani civilians, including children, have been killed in central Mali, the most recent case of ethnic violence which cost hundreds of lives last year. The government says the attackers, who are dressed, um, who are dressed as traditional Donzo hunters, raided the village of Kulogon in the central Mopti region. Mulag Guindo, the mayor of um, Bankas, the nearest town, says the attack occurred around the time of the first call to prayer um, of the new year and targeted Fulani part of Kulogon. Mali has been in turmoil since Tuareg rebels and loosely allied is Islamists took over its north in 2012, prompting French forces to intervene to push them back the following year. Well, six people have been killed and 16 injured in a train accident on the Great Belt Bridge in Denmark. Rail network officials said debris from a freight train hit a commuter train during a heavy storm, forcing it to break suddenly. Rescuers are working to free around 100 passengers who remain trapped on board. There were 131 passengers and three crew members on board at the time of the accident, and an emergency center has been set up at the western end of the bridge in the town of Nyborg. And to sport, Rangers International Football Club of Enugu has resumed training for the Confederation of African Football Cup and the forthcoming Nigeria Professional Football League. Rangers' next opponent in the Confederation Cup is Bantu Football Club of Lesotho and the first leg of the second round will be played on January 13. The club spokesperson Norbert Okoli says the players have promised to take off from where they stopped in 2018. The media officer appreciated the players for their effort in 2018 and urged them to put more effort in the new year. Christian Pulisic is joining Chelsea in a 58 million euros deal 
that will see him loaned back to Dortmund for the remainder of the 2018-2019 season. The USA International has impressed since making the breakthrough for the Bundesliga side during the 2015-2016 campaign and has since made 115 appearances for the first team, scoring 15 goals and creating another 24. He has, however, struggled to hold down a regular starting place in Lucien Fever's side, which is at the top of the league, six points ahead of Bayern Munich, while the 20-year-old has featured only four times from the beginning of matches in the league, with his um, last start coming on September 29. FIFA President Gianni Infantino says the body could increase the size of the Football World Cup in Qatar 2022 to 48 from 32 teams. Last month, Infantino said a majority of national football federations were in favor of expanding the tournament and a decision was expected ahead of the qualifying draw in March. Infantino now says FIFA was seeing whether it would be possible for some of Qatar's golf neighbors to host some of the matches. And that is our news now. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I am Fidelia Agoncha. Bye for now. Thank you.